Uh, if I haven't met you before, my name is Brian. By the way, I'm on staff here at Lake Springs. And uh, today we're going to continue our series through uh, Psalms. We're looking at a handful of Psalms and uh, reading through them, praying through them, and seeing what we can learn from them. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 91. And so to start us off, I'm just going to read us through the whole Psalm, and then we will uh, kind of go back through and look at it verse by verse and see what it's actually saying to us. So Psalm 91, starting in verse 1. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hand, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and and the cobra, you will trample the great lion and the serpent." Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Uh, Let's take a moment and pray this morning as we get started. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for what we can learn from them. And God, I just pray that you be with us this morning. Help us to hear what you have to say to us. God, I pray that you be with me. Help me communicate clearly for you. God, just be with us as we spend time together worshiping you this morning. And we thank you that we have the ability to do that. We pray in your name. Amen. Uh, So I'm curious if you ever had a time in your life where you felt like the world was ending. Like, there's no coming back from this. This is as bad as it gets. And uh, there's, this, there's just, the world is over. For me, this happened probably a bunch of times. But it happened once that stuck out to me in probably middle school-ish. Now, a few weeks ago, I, to- I told a story about a time I was in middle school and got caught ringing people's doorbells and got in a lot of trouble. And at that time, I also thought the world was ending. And so this time, I, I also thought, but this time was probably a little more serious, and I, I kind of use middle school as the umbrella term because I'm really bad at remembering ages that things happen, so I think it happened around that time, but younger, in school, something like that. And so when I was, when I was in, around that age, me and my friends, we really liked to play paintball. And uh, so we would, we would go to actual parks to do that, but we'd also just go in the woods and, and play and stuff like that. And one of my buddies, his house, kind of it was his house, and he had, his neighbors were all his, like, grandparents, aunts, and uncles, and so forth, and they had a farm behind. They had cows and stuff like that, and a bunch of fields. Then behind those, they had some woods, and in those woods, they had hay bales. And so we would go back in there, and we would use those as kind of like bunkers, and we would uh, play around that, and it was great. And we did it all the time, and we were allowed to. It was fine. No, never got in trouble for it or anything like that. Until one day, where my friend, who, who, who lived in that house, had the genius idea to throw a smoke bomb to kind of cover up, you know, so he could sneak around. And so we're on, we're on opposite sides of these hay bales, and he lights it, and he tosses it over, and he makes a good toss, but as it's going over, it hits a tree and falls right on a hay bale. And it catches on fire. And so, and so he yells, fire! And so we think that means, okay, shoot! So we start shooting. <laughs> and uh, then we see that it's actually on fire, and um, so we start panicking. We're all like, you know, middle school or early high school, we don't know what to do. We're trying to like pull the, the pieces off or put stuff up to keep the fire from spreading, but it's just spreading. It was dry, it's just spreading. And so we're panicked. We're like, we don't know what to do. So me and another buddy of mine who also lived in the house, there's two brothers, uh, we're like, okay, we're gonna run back home and get some help because we're far from the house, you know, cell phones or anything like that. So we start running and we're trucking and we're going through the fields and as we're running, his shoes fly off for some reason and he steps on a beehive. And so he's, he's screaming, he's like, my, my feet, my feet. And we're like, who cares? The world is burning down. And so we're running and we get there and we go inside and we tell his mom and she kind of looks back, doesn't see anything. And she thinks we're joking. She's like, okay, it's on fire, okay. 
And we're like, no, seriously, it's on fire. And uh, so she's like, well, um, those are your uncles talking to him. Your uncles, that's your uncle's hay. So why don't you go down the street and tell him? If, if there's a problem, go tell him. We're like, okay, fine. So we go down there, knock on his door. He's not home. We come back. We're like, we don't know what to do. And so she looks back, and by this time, you can actually see smoke coming up. And so she's like, oh, okay. They're, they're serious. So call 911. <laughs> And we go back there, and the fire department comes, and because, you know, these are like cow pastures, there's a bunch of like narrow gates and so forth to get there, and hilly and bumpy terrain, and so the fire trucks can't get back there. And so they end up sending, this is my memory at least, it's probably flawed, but my memory at least is they send this like 1950s looking little truck, little fire truck to go bumping along back there, and they finally get back there, they start working on it, and me and my friends, we're just sitting there just watching this thing burn, and everyone struggled to put it out, and we're just like, the world is over, we're, we're done. We are dead. Uh, we're in so much trouble. His, his, his parents show up, and his dad was great and is a great man, but he was very stern. And uh, he showed up. He made them throw all their gear in his truck and, and hauled them off. And we're like, well, we're never going to see them again. They're, they're, they're done. <laughs> and, uh, which I, I have seen them again, thankfully. And I still know them to this day, so they did survive. Uh, but, but one by one, our parents came and picked us up, and we're just like, man, this is, this is as bad as it gets. It ended up taking a few days for them to put out all the fire. They were working on it for multiple days. Uh, it ended up costing like thousands of dollars worth of um, hay. Well, I don't know what hay costs, but thousands of dollars worth of hay, we found out. And uh, so we're just like, we, we are all just in so much trouble. And I remember the next day, this happened, the next day I woke up, and you know, I, I typically go and like play with my friends or something like that, because this was during the summer. And I remember thinking, am I in trouble for this? I didn't actually do anything. I didn't do anything wrong. I wasn't the one that threw it. I'm not, that, I'm not that dumb. I didn't do anything wrong. But I was there, and something bad happened. And I feel like my parents had the same thought, because it, I never, it didn't really get in trouble, but it's like, well, something should happen. So I just like, went with my mom to church that day, and then I could play with my friends the next day. <laughs> but I remember thinking, for me, that was not that big a deal. But for my buddies, this had to be the end of the world for them. Like, they had to have gotten in so much trouble. I don't think I ever even asked them about it, because I didn't want to know what happened. I didn't, wanna, I didn't want more information than I needed to know. But at the time, being a kid, doing that much damage and having that many adults mad at you, man, I just thought, there's, there's, no, there's nothing worse than this. There's no, no, life does not get worse than it gets right now. And I'm curious if you've ever thought something similar uh, on a more serious note. If you've ever gone through something and you've just thought, it doesn't get any worse than this whether a sickness or a death or something that you've experienced with your family or any number of things, if you've just sat there and thought, Man, I don't know how I can get through this. I don't know where to go from here. And so if you've ever felt that before, or if you haven't, I also want to say if you've never felt that before, that's okay. That's, that's not a bad thing, but you're probably sitting near somebody who has. And so if you're dealing with that right now or you have in the past, this is the question I want to ask. And it's simply this, how are you getting through? How are you getting through? When you're going through something that's so difficult in life, what are you doing to actually survive it and get through? Where is your refuge? Where is your safe place? See, we do a number of things to get through. Uh, oftentimes, we, we do things like we lean really hard into work to get through because that will distract me from what's going on at, uh, at home or, or in this other part of my life, and so I'll just work as much as I can so I don't have to think about it. Or we try and fill these gaps with people, relationships, but do so in an unhealthy way where we put it on them instead of on ourselves. We try and make up for it with money or things or houses or cars. Not because we think it's going to fix the problem, but maybe the joy that this thing will bring me will outweigh the pain that's being caused to me right now. Or there's the, the obvious ones, like drugs and alcohol and going, for some, going to something for relief from what's going on in your life. So if you're going through that, I want to know, how are you getting through? Well, we're going to be looking again at Psalm 91. We're going to dive into it a little bit more in detail. And we're going to be looking at how we can get through when life is really dark and really tough. So Psalm 91, this is a, this is a messianic psalm. So this is a psalm that's pointing to Jesus. So as we're reading it today, read, that, read it um, with that in mind, in that, through that lens of everything we're reading about is talking about the coming Messiah, is talking about Jesus. So let's read it again, a couple verses at a time, starting in verse 1 of Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
So it says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. When it's talking about resting in the shadow of the Almighty, think of it like being stranded in a desert where there's this, this oppressive heat from the sun on you and there's nowhere to go for, uh, for a break from it. All you want in that, in that moment is a shadow, is something to block this oppressive heat from you. And this is what the psalmist is saying, is that if you dwell in the shelter of the Most High and re- you can rest in the shadow of the Almighty, that he will provide protection from the pain that life can cause. And when it says rest, the word rest in the translation that we read, other translations say abide. And this idea of abiding is something that we hear from Jesus as well in the New Testament. In fact, in John 15, this is Jesus talking. He says this, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, but apart from me you can do nothing. When he talks about the vine and the branches, you can think of it like a tree trunk and its branches. A branch, apart from the trunk, does nothing. It dies. If you go out to a tree and cut off, the, cut off a limb, that limb will die because it's not getting that, the, 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 the life that it needs from the trunk. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, apart from me, cut yourself off from me, and you can do nothing. On your own, you can do nothing. But attached to me, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. See, whoever abides in Jesus or remains in him will bear fruit. And whoever abides in the shadow of the Almighty who rests in his power, will receive salvation and protection. Or we can put it another way and say that to rest in the shadow of the Almighty is simply to, <clears throat> excuse me, is simply to be with Jesus. Just to be with Jesus. If you're new with us, we talk about that a lot here at Lake Springs. In fact, it's, it's, it's part of our mission to help people be with Jesus and to become like Jesus and to do what Jesus did. But you can't do what Jesus did and you can't become like Jesus until you're actually with him. And so that's what he's saying here, is just to be with Jesus, just to rest in the power of the Almighty, to trust explicitly in the love of God. And the psalmist continues in verse 3. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishments of the wicked. So he talks about uh, the, the fowler snare. He says, surely he'll save you from the fowler snare. This is, a, this is a trap for birds, a bird trap, is the way you think about it. He's saying he will save you from the traps that you are caught in. And let me tell you, that is a really good thing. Because... If you are a believer, if you are in Jesus, we have an enemy that is very good at setting traps. And is not just very good at setting traps, but is very good at knowing the right traps to set. You know, I think back to a few years ago at the church we were at before coming here, we had a friend who was a doctor. And uh, in that time that we knew her, she took a, a, a missions trip, I guess you could call it, down to South America and there. It was, it was a handful of doctors. They're bringing some medicine down there, vi- visiting some remote villages to, to bring some medical care and medicine and so forth. And when she came back, she said, you know, it was really fascinating. She had no idea this was going on down there. She said, when, when we got down there, we found that their practice in this village that they went to for medicine was, you know, they believed in, in, in magic and so forth, and they would call a, a, a a medicine man. I don't remember what the term that they use, but he would come, and if someone was sick, he would come to them, and what they would do is they would bring a guinea pig, and they would cut it open and find out what was ailing the guinea pig or what it had that was damaged inside of it, and they would say, okay, this is what's wrong with you. And she said, the craziest thing is, in my time there, more often than not, they were right. They were right. And she said, I think that the reason that happened is because the devil knows what works in different contexts. Knows that this is something for this group of people that could lead them away from looking to God, to looking to something else, and relying instead on the, this magic or these practices that they had. Because that would never, that wouldn't fool much of anyone here. We're, we're so, we're, we live in such a science-focused society that if someone were to claim to be able to do that, no one would really give them a second thought. 
And so what traps are set for us here in America today? Well, let me tell you, I think one of the biggest traps that are set for, that's set for us is a much simpler trap, and it's the trap of distraction. We live to be distracted. People spend their lives trying to get your attention. Millions of people spend their lives trying to get your attention. You know, we live in the most distracted time in the world. We all have something in our pocket that serves to do nothing, or to do very I shouldn't say nothing, to do very little other than distract us. And it's not just distract us from God, it's distract us from our kids, from our spouse, from our families, from life going on around us, from nature, the beauty of creation, everything. We live in a world that is full of distraction. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it was really interesting. Last night, as I was um, getting ready to go to bed and, and, and thinking about this and so forth, I started to get anxious for today. I don't really get anxious that much when I preach anymore. I, I, I used to really bad, but not really so much anymore. I started to get kind of anxious last night. There were some things that I usually do when preparing that I wasn't able to do this week, and I was, I was, I was getting a little anxious for this morning. And so, you know what I did? I distracted myself. I spent a, way longer than I should, stayed up way later than I should have, just scrolling, watching fishing videos, <laughs> not praying, not asking for help with this anxiety for this morning, not doing anything beneficial, staying up later than I should have, and if you don't know, we have a two-month-old who wakes up a lot in the night, so I, was gonna get, I wasn't going to get much sleep anyways, but making it even worse on myself for no reason. And, and as, as it was getting late, I remember looking at the clock and thinking, <laughs> isn't it so ironic? In a few hours, I'm going to get up there and talk about how distracted we are. And all I've done tonight is be distracted. This is the trap that is set for us, is the trap of distraction. But the good news is, we have a God that can free us from that trap. We have a God that doesn't say, just have more willpower, just do, uh, you know, download uh, these different apps on your phone to limit things on your phone so you won't spend time, which all those things are fine, but he doesn't say, do it on your own. He says, embrace me, and I will help you with it. See, the psalmist is telling us the world is a scary place. He, he, he says in these verses, he says, his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. So he talks about the fear at night, the arrow at day, the pestilence in the darkness, or the unseen things, the things that you can't see, the plague that destroys at midday. And what he's saying is there are things we need protection from every moment of every day of your life. We need protection from everything that's going on. And thankfully, we have that protection in the Lord. And he continues on to talk about that protection and that refuge that we have in verse 9. It says, If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, if a, if a couple of these verses sound uh, familiar to you, it's because these are verses that the devil quotes to Jesus as he's tempting him in the wilderness. So in, in Matthew chapter 4, we, we see the accounts of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 5, it says this. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord, the Lord your God, to the test. So he's saying, take yourself to the highest point in the temple and throw yourself off, because you'll be caught. That's what the Psalms say. He knows what the Psalms say. You'll be fine, so why not just do it? But you know what's really interesting? He quotes from Psalm 91, 11 and 12. Those are the verses he reads. But he conveniently stops before reading verse 13. Because verse 13 says, you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. And who is the psalmist talking about there? He's talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan. We know in the New Testament, we know that uh, 1 Peter 
um, uh, that Peter describes him, the, the, the enemy, the devil, as a, as a roaring lion, prowling, looking for someone to devour. We know in Genesis that he takes the form of a serpent to tempt Eve. See, these are references to the evil one. And I think that these pas- this passage in Matthew gives us a perfect example at the danger of cherry-picking Scripture. Because that's what's happening here. He's looking at these couple verses and saying, well, this applies to you, but not looking at the full entirety of what's going on. You see, we hear things all the time. I don't know if you do, at least, but I do. I hear people say things like, the Bible is so full of contradictions, or how do you explain this single verse? I don't, I, you know, the Bible says this single thing, and how, how do you explain that thing? And let me tell you, the way that you explain these things is with context, is with understanding what's going on in the scripture and what's going on in the book. That's why I love here at Lake Springs that we preach through whole books of the Bible, that we preach through whole sections or chapters at a time, that we focus on the the whole of scripture instead of just taking ideas. So if anyone ever asks you about a single verse, uh, why does something say this? Or why, or why does the Bible say this? Or, or explain this. The, the first thing you can do, or the first thing you should do is start by just reading that whole chapter and then reading that whole book to get a better idea of what's actually going on in that situation. And, and I'm not saying this to say that if anyone's ever said that to you that uh, I'm comparing them to the devil or anything like that. But what I am saying is please let us be careful to not do the same thing. Please let us be careful not to take a single verse somewhere in Scripture and use it to defend a point that that Scripture is not talking about in the slightest. To, to, to support something that probably shouldn't be supported or to condemn something that maybe shouldn't be condemned. How, we, we need to be so careful not to just take a single verse and throw it in somebody's face and use that as a defense without looking at the context of what's going on in the Scripture. See, the psalmist is saying that if you make the Lord your dwelling, you will tread on the head of the evil one, that there is nobody that can stand up against you if you abide in the Lord. And then in these next couple verses, as we get to the end of this chapter, we we finally see the Lord speak. So the, the, the last couple chapters leading up to this, the Lord is silent. And the psalmist is crying out to the Lord, basically saying um, that he's crying out to the Lord, trying to get the Lord to hear him, to, to respond to him. In fact, Psalm 88 t- says, uh, a verse in Psalm 88 says, Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Psalm 89 says, How long, Lord, will you, will you hide yourself forever? Psalm 90 says, Have compassion on your servants. He's crying out to God, but we don't hear anything from God until we finally do hear towards the end of Psalm 91. It says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. See, what we see here is God promise rescue and protection, that he will always be with us. But what he doesn't promise is that you will never experience trouble, that you will never experience hardship. In fact, you can consider it a promise that you will experience hardship and trouble if you are in Christ. Jesus experienced trouble. John, Paul, all the disciples, everyone that, is, that, that we see that closely follows the Lord experiences a difficult, difficult life. In fact, in 1 Peter 4.15, he says, Peter writes, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange has happened to you. He's saying, if, if life is tough as a follower of Jesus, then that's, don't, don't be surprised. It's not as if something weird is happening to you. That's the way it is. So don't be shocked when life is tough as a follower of Jesus. But thankfully, we don't have to deal with that toughness, that that, that difficulty on our own. I heard someone say recently that the the thing that they were struggling with most in their faith was the idea that God will never give you more than you can handle. And you may know this, but that is very far from the truth. You will have more than you can handle in life. Life, things that we've experienced, and I... I know many people that have experienced things much more difficult than I have, but even just the things that I've experienced in life, I cannot handle on my own. But we are never asked to. We're never asked to. The fact of the matter is, you will never experience more than God can handle. You'll never experience more than God can handle, and he doesn't ask you to handle it on your own, but he says, abide in me, rest in me, and rely on me to handle what you're going through. 
Or you can put this another way and say that nothing is out of God's control. Nothing is out of God's control. So how do we reconcile the fact that nothing is out of God's control? Well, we're dealing with a situation that feels hopeless. We're dealing with something that you feel like there's no way out of, that I don't know how to come back from this. How do we reconcile that? And the reality is that if you are in Jesus, there is no hopeless situation. If you are in Jesus, there is no ultimate hopelessness. It may feel like it in the moment, but in the end, there is no hopelessness if you are in Jesus. But for that to be true, the inverse is true as well. That if you are not in Jesus, the world is filled with hopelessness. Have you looked around at the world right now? It's tough. We live in a world that is filled with hopelessness, of people trying to find hope in anything possible. We live in a world that is desperate to find hope, but is failing left and right. And if you are feeling hopeless, or like you are in an impossible situation that there is no way out of, then I want you to listen to the words that Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. These verses will be on the screen, and I'll read them for us. But uh, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What Paul is saying is that life will be very tough for you, for us. And there's no denying that. If you're going through something difficult right now, it's, it's, it's not um, because of, of something you did or anything like that. But if you're going through something difficult right now, he's saying that there's nothing that you can go through that can separate you from the love of Christ. As hard as life may seem, as difficult as what your situation may seem like right now, it will not separate you from the love of Christ because he won't turn your back, his back on you. But all he asks you to do is to rest in him, to find that rest in Jesus. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. See, we worship a God who is not just a God that saves, who is not just a God that protects, but is also a God that comforts, that sees the situation that you are in and empathizes and wants to offer comfort to you. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those uh, those in any trouble with the comfort we received from God. He's saying that not only does God comfort, but he comforts in a way that allows us to pass that comfort along to somebody else. That it's not just so that we can be comforted, but so that we can experience the comfort of the Lord, and then we can pass that along to someone else who's hurting. And let me tell you, if you're wondering, because <laughs> uh, I've wondered this many times myself, of what is, what is the way to comfort somebody? I've known people that have gone through things that I've never gone through, and I just want to know the right thing to say. I want to know how to help them in the situation that they're in. Well, let me tell you, the right, way to, or the right thing to say, the right way to comfort them, is to say nothing is just to be with them. Not to offer advice, not to try and fix it, it's just to be there. You know, at the uh, the end of last year, we went through a really difficult season um, with one of our uh, foster kids leaving, and it was really, really tough. And it was really hard. And uh, there were two people that said exactly what I, two people outside of my family, I should say, that said exactly the right thing to me. And one of them was Derek. If you're new with us, Derek is our lead pastor. He's out for a few weeks, but he'll be back. Um, the, the day after everything happened, I told him I needed to, to talk to him. We sat in that upper room right up there, and I just wept for a long time. I told him, I need to, I need to take some time off work. I can't be here. I just I need, I need some time. And he just sat there and listened. And he said, I don't have the right things to say 
but we can just sit here and be sad together. And I had another friend from our, our previous church reach out, and he is someone who's been through, um, he's older, been through a lot more life than I have, and someone who I would expect to have the best things to say. And he reached out, and he said the exact same thing. He said, I, I can't tell you anything. All I can do is, if you'd like, I can come over, and we can just be sad together. And I hope, I believe that we are, but I hope we can continue to be a church that is willing to just mourn with people. That if you're newer with us and you're going through a difficult situation, that you can come to somebody and not expect to hear the right words and not expect to get the best advice, but expect to get someone who will just be sad with you. In fact, if you are in that season right now, you can come and talk to me after service or anyone on staff or any of the elders or anyone wearing a lanyard and we will not have the right words to say. We will not give the best advice, but we can just mourn with you and we can just be with you in this difficult time. Because at the end of the day, the only one that can offer the true and real comfort is the Lord. But the comfort that we can offer is just being with each other in community and being there for each other when we're going through a difficult situation. And so we're going to end service a little different today. If you've been with us throughout this series or, or, or if you're newer with us, at the end of each of these messages, we've been um, committing a few verses to memory and we're not going to do that today. Well, we are, but in a different way. Uh, the, the verses are not going to go up on the screen and we're not going to say them out loud and memorize them. Um, instead, at each of the four communion tables, which we're going to take communion in a moment, there are cards on each of the tables. And what these cards have is they have Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16, printed on them. But with each of the space that a pronoun is, he, him, so forth, a blank. And what I would like you to do is to, as you come and take communion, take one of those cards back to your seat with you and write your name in those blanks. Because it is so easy to think of Scripture as this abstract idea, this great thing that applies to the world but doesn't really apply to me. And so I want us to read these verses and try and commit them to memory but in a different way and read these verses in a way that allows us to remember that when the Lord is speaking here, if I am a believer, if I am in Jesus, he is talking to me. And so Psalm 14 through 16, if you do this and if you write it this way, it'll say this. For me, it'll say, because Brian loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect Brian, for he acknowledges my name. I, Brian will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with Brian in trouble, and I will deliver Brian and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy Brian and show him my salvation. See, take this. Write your own name in there. Put it somewhere where you'll see it every day. Put it on your nightstand, in your Bible, on your mirror, in your car, wherever. And remember that these words that are spoken are not just a good idea, but they're speaking to you. And that if you are in Christ, these apply to you as well. Let's pray together. Father, the, the world is a hard place. There is so much great going on, but there is also so much hardship going on and so many difficult things coming from every direction. And God, there is no universe where I could handle it on my own. But God, thank you that you do not ask us to handle it on our own. That you don't say, go and deal with the situation you're in and then come to me. And once you got it all sorted out, then I'll be there for you. But you say, no, come to me in your sickness, in your hardship, in your difficulty and find rest in me. And God, we need some rest. We need some rest. God, be with us and help us to be with you. We pray in your son's name. Amen.